Hi everyone, I'm Noah Petro, the project scientist of NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft, which has been at the moon for over a decade now, sending back a treasure trove of data, including some spectacular images. Take a look at that. Inevitably, whenever NASA publishes a photo or releases a video of ours showing the lunar landscape, we get emails, tweets, and online posts from viewers asking us to further explain some of the weird looking visuals that they're seeing. So today, we're going to look at these strange and mysterious looking features on the moon to answer the question, what the heck is that? So let's launch into this. The moon. In our video, Apollo 13 Views of the Moon, many viewers wonder about this strange looking circle with dark lines. So what the heck is that? Well, for starters, this is not the remnants of an ancient lake. And apologies to the sci-fi crowd, it's not a secret moon base with runways for spacecraft. This is a geological feature known as Kamarov Crater. It's 80 kilometers wide and it's on the far side of the moon on the edge of Mare Moscoviense. The floor is covered with a network of rills that make it look like sun-dried mud. And it's a great example of a floor fractured crater, or FFC. So what made Komarov look like that? The leading idea among scientists is that FFCs are like volcanoes that didn't quite reach the surface. An impactor hits the moon, forming the crater. And underneath the crater floor, the impact creates a zone of broken rock called a breccia lens. Magma from deeper inside the moon rises into the cracks of the breccia lens, but something stops it from getting all the way to the surface. So it spreads out under the crater floor, forming what's called a sill. The magma and hot gases in the sill push on the crater floor from below, causing it to bulge and fracture like the top of a cake in an oven. The cracks you see are known as graben. Release the graben! Using data from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, scientists have cataloged over 100 floor fractured craters, just like Kamara. They are fascinating works of nature from billions of years ago. Billions. An image from the Apollo 11 mission has gotten a lot of attention over the years. Here you see a pair of craters known as Messier and Messier A. But they don't look like the more typical round craters that you see on the moon. Elro has taken even more high definition shots of these two sites, showing us incredible detail. These oval shapes and areas of ejected rock do look like they could belong in Star Wars as the crash site of the Millennium Falcon. And actually, the way you might imagine a scene like that happening, with an object slamming and then skipping across the surface, is what took place here, except with an asteroid. You see, at very low angles, an incoming asteroid can actually become decapitated, with the top part splitting off at the impact and either escaping back into space or skipping to form a second crater. Think of it like skipping a stone across the water. Both laboratory impact experiments and computer modeling have demonstrating the physical effects of the oblique impact of a large asteroid on the moon. And LRO's data helps prove the formation of these unusual features. LRO. Scattered across the lunar surface are these long winding features, <coughs> which many viewers have correctly assumed are channels. On the moon, these are called rills. There's a prominent one here on the Aristarchus Plateau. And if you're comparing the visuals on the Earth, you might be tempted to think about long river canyons flowing in long sweeping meanders, like the mighty Mississippi pouring out into the Gulf of Mexico. And if that's what you're thinking, erase it from your memory, because it's wrong. Now to be fair, when these channels were observed on the moon for the first time, there was an immediate thought that water may have carved these features. But once we got actual samples from the moon, combined with additional spacecraft data and studies over the years, we've come to understand that there was never flowing water on the moon. So what could carve these sweeping features? If you said flowing liquid hot magma after it erupted on the moon's surface, you'd be correct. Winner. When lava flows across the surface, it erodes the crust and slowly flows as it bends and turns, forming these beautiful channels. We have a great view of this in our Rima Prinz visualization. Here you see a long channel where lava once flowed from the Vera of volcanic depression. Eruptions of lava fountains formed a lake of lava 300 meters deep and carved a lava channel 100 times deeper than anything found on the Earth. These types of features were so compelling that the Apollo 15 mission went and explored one in 1971, known as the Hadley Rill. Future explorers may want to visit others, but they should leave their fishing lines at home. This visual is one of our most popular. This is a picture of Tycho Crater and the famous Central Peak Boulder, which is about 400 feet wide. Now that's longer than a football field. Whee! How in the world did that wind up there? Well, I have no idea. No, dead dummit. <laughs> We're gonna fly now into a spot on the near side to look at this weird feature, which has long defied an easy explanation. It's known as Reiner Gamma. Those squiggles and swirls sure are bizarre. 
combination of computer modeling and data gathered from numerous recent lunar missions, including Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, now sheds light on the origin of these unusual surface decorations, which we call lunar swirls. Now think of it this way. You've probably been told that when you go outside to put on your sunscreen. Well, these beautiful swirls are constant reminders that the moon is no different from you and me, uh, except that it's a moon and we're humans. These swirls are examples of what happens when the moon applies SPF 3 million. The moon is constantly bombarded by radiation from the sun and galaxy, as well as micrometeorites that sandblast the surface. These swirls, however, show what happens when the radiation is blocked from reaching the surface. Uh, data suggests that small magnetic anomalies block radiation from reaching the surface and therefore prevent the moon from getting sunburned in these areas, which keep them as bright as they appear to be. So the next time you put on sunblock to go lounge outside, think of the moon and how it gets baked in the sun, just like you and me. Thanks for watching today. Hopefully this video taught you more about the moon and that you aren't left thinking, what the heck was that? I'm Noah Petro, signing off. Well, hello everybody. This is Scott Roberts uh, with the Explore Alliance Live pre presentation of the Open Go To community, and. Um, we have, uh, we have a nice uh, group of people here today, people you all know, Jerry Hubble uh, out there in uh, Mission Control. We got Tyler Bowman with the telescope growing out of his head, and Heath Creekmore still trying to get into the Space Force. So anyhow, <laughs> we all had to wake up early today because our time changed, you know, and uh, so that was, um, if you see that a bag or two under my eyes, uh, that's the reason why. Anyways, um, we are getting ready for our 19th Global Star Party, and this is our 99th show for the Open Go To community. So uh, we are on um, Wednesday, I guess, uh, we will have our 100th show. Gonna be, okay. We're going to party like we're 1999 today? Today, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you got them, smoke them, okay? So, uh, you know, poor shots, whatever you got to do, you know, to celebrate or just, uh, you know, do your, do your little happy dance. But, um, uh, and also on Wednesday, because of the U.S. presidential elections, we're going to move the star party to Wednesday. Um, We'll see how that goes, uh, but I, I think that'll be great. Um, and uh, we won't interrupt anybody's, uh, uh, you know, time to watch the all-important elections. So anyhow, but uh, Global Star Party 19 should be great. Uh, of course, we have David Levy, David Iker. There are people RSVPing for this particular star party, including, uh, you know, uh, Deep T uh, Gautam from Nepal. She'll be on for her third installment of her series. Um, we will have Libby in the stars. When, when I understand, Abigail Bolenbach will be joining us as well as some others. So uh, real excited to have that uh, uh, global star party happening. Um, and um, so uh, let's get into today's show here. We've got, uh, we got uh, Heath Creekmore, and he has been kind of getting bitten by the bug in astrophotography. So uh, he was here this weekend working on Saturday, running back and forth to my office, um, uh, showing me images of the moon that he's done. And I thought that maybe you could share those and tell what your experience is like, Heath. Yeah, definitely. Um... I don't know. I've just been taking pictures of the moon. <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. Um, he so started. Was, he started with a, a iPhone shot of the Orion Nebula through a, yeah. a twenty-inch telescope. But mm -hmm. you know, yeah. But uh, and it's not like he was cheating or anything using a twenty-inch. He still had to, you know, he was hand holding his iPhone above the eyepiece, which is not really easy. Um, but yeah, and that uh, thing is taller than me, so. Uh, and it's taller than him. Up here. <laughs> Sure oh yeah, because the Ryan was probably pretty high at the time, right? Oh um, yeah, <laughs> it was <Right>. like <laughs> right. That's cool. 
So let's see what you got here. Yeah, let's go. Do, do, do. Uh -huh. Let's see. <clears throat> there we go. All right. Very cool. So this right, is my now, first one. This is your first one. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, so I used now, Auto Stacker. Okay, so you one. have to talk about the equipment a little bit. So okay. what are you using? Uh, right now, I've been using... Okay, I'm going to keep this in front of my face. QHY 5-2. Dash 2, dash two. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm using an ED-102. Oh, ED-102. On an IXOS 100. Great scope, okay. So that's what I'm using. It's, okay. It's been a lot to learn, but this is with Auto Stacker. I had a lot of uh, noise lines, so I asked Tyler, "What on earth do I do? <laughs> How do I fix that?" Yeah, <laughs> right? so we, we we tried to take some uh, darks and flats, get that going. Okay. Um, and I that's not a deep cut. Deep <laughs> Jerry's cut. shaking his head like, "Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I tried." Now, um, now, why t technically, why are these lines even occurring in the first place? Oh Lord! This is Tyler, this. Jerry. Thank you. I'll let Tyler <laughs> Tyler answer. No, 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 no. <laughs> we had it to clear up with the darks and the flats. They went away. I want to hear Jerry's explanation. What's your explanation, Tyler? It's no telling. It's... Honestly, I don't. <laughs> I don't have lines through my images, so. Anybody in the audience know what it yeah, is? Yes. So what it is? What it is? Okay. It is. It is Darks, uh, darks and biases. It's a really it's bias noise is what it is. It's bias noise. It's okay. Read noise. It shouldn't be there. So if he did a bias frame and um, uh, uh, what you subtract a bias frame from yeah. this image, is that what yeah. that? Well, would... that that would help. I, I I've never seen this myself, but I know. I mean, I know what it is because I I've, I've seen it in other people's pictures. It's a bias problem with the scanning. It's a noise problem within the electronics. Um, that's why it's a regular pattern like that. It's it's related to the readout. But what? How? So how did you acquire these images? Was it a, was it a video with SharpCap? Yeah, it was SharpCap. I I did an oh. SER file. An uh, SER file. You should do well. I've never used SER files. I've always used AVI files. So I don't know. I don't know if it's related to that or not. It probably. That's what it just defaults to, Jerry. Uh -huh. It defaults to the SDR file. Yeah, yeah. So I'd be curious to see if all your videos have this noise or if there's something special about your where the area you were at, if there's some kind of interference radio or some other kind of interference causing this band pattern when you're reading the data off the, off the CCD. Mm -hmm. There could uh, be. Gary Palmer's watching right now. What, is, what does Gary think it is? Yeah, what does Gary think? Um, <clears throat> that's really good resolution, though. I mean, if you zoom up on it, you can see really tiny features. Oh yeah, there's it is good. You see, see here, um, see the he two craters. Focus. There's two craters right there, right there. That's Messier and Messier Alpha. No, down right were the two craters. Oh, right that's here those two center. craters that we saw. That's in... those two craters. Right there. I'm sorry, I don't see him. <laughs> where you had your mouse just now? All right, from over, what, where, over to the down a little bit and over to the right. Just right. Down, <laughs> over right here, there, right there. Gotcha. Okay. Those cool. are those two craters. Sweet. So, if, once I did some darks and flats, we threw it in Deep Sky Stacker, and uh, I'm probably have to escape out of this. So this was a video, right? So you don't. You don't have to do video. With, you don't have to do flats or any calibration really with video because you're you're giving you're getting the best uh, pieces out of each um, piece of the image for each frame, and it's um, and it's normalizing the brightness and all this other stuff. So you don't need to do apply a flat at all. Yeah. You should not. Okay. You should not do that because that adds noise. Also. Okay. I'll redo it then. Use a piece. Um, so that looks that looks good. It's a little contrasty, but that looks really good. Yeah, there's some blur looking that, stuff in here. Was this during a full moon, basically? 
It was the day before. It was the third. Yeah, so there's no Terminator. So, but it looks really good. Zoom up on it a little bit. Uh, see, see the uh, see the little rays coming off the two craters, the Messier and Messier Alpha. Yeah, over here. Yeah, the other one's that? better. The other picture's better with that. So this could, yeah. Yeah, you seem a little bit better. Now, also, it's really interesting. It's almost like you're using an interlace. It's like maybe scroll zoom up on it again. I wonder if that, I wonder if that SER video file is like a that looks. That looks like an interlace pattern. Yeah, it does. Looks like television. Yeah, it's exactly <laughs> right. Maybe that's the SCR file. Encodes it that way. I don't know. <laughs> it's really odd. It's like two frames. See how it's one frame's lighter than the other? See yeah. how the yeah. lines are? <clears throat> Definitely. So. Barry says use SCR files only for auto stock of two. Uh, really? And he says, don't subtract anything from the moon. The other thing that it's a little disorienting for me is that uh, I usually make sure my camera's oriented so north is up and east is right so you can look at the moon. But that's this is fine. That's Tycho, that real bright crater on the right, and the Copernicus is on the on the right hand side. Tycho's on the left. I think it's mm -hmm. great, Heath. Thanks. Yeah, it looks good. That's much better than the, any picture I did. <laughs> yeah. First time. That's right. And those lines might have been just an effect you were going after, right? Actually, no. <laughs> the retro TV look. Yeah, that's right. Like it looked like it was a Apollo, video camera on a Apollo spaceship. Yeah. It's a Apollo <laughs> 11 spaceship camera. Yeah, that's right. Video camera. Yeah, that's it. Cool. Richard Gray says, I generally point my scope as far away from the moon as possible. You're missing out on a lot of stuff. Yeah, that's right. That's great, Heath. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. So I what's going to be your next uh, uh, object after you move on from the moon? What do you want uh, to do? I don't know. Andromeda. He's got to spend 20 years on the moon. What are you talking about? He could. You don't do know it. anything about the moon. Will the moon hold years. your fascination that long? Do you I mean, think? It's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed every time I see it, but I mean, I'm newer. So, I don't Some know. people spend their whole lives on it. It's beautiful. Um, a friend of mine, Howard Eskildson, uh, who's uh, with, uh, we got, he's part of, he, he's, he works uh, with the ALPO, doesn't he? He's, yeah, he's some he's Howard? he's he's a member of ALPO. He submits images to me. I'm the um, that dude the, photographs really. I mean, he photographs the sun every day in calcium, yeah. hydrogen, and white light every day. Uh, he um, I don't know how often he images the moon, but I bet it's more often than once a week. So oh yeah, he's he's doing it. He sends out pictures every at least once a week. At least once a week. Yep. Yep. And so he uses a nine. He uses a nine-inch celestron. A clear matrix pattern. Yep. What did he say? He said it's a Bayer ma matrix pattern. Was that a color camera? It's mono. Yeah, it's not. That's. <clears throat> okay. Before we move on, I'll, I'll recognize the people who are watching us today. We have James, the astrophotographer. Arietta Dergudi is watching. Um, Michael Whitaker. Mike Wiesner. We have three mics. Um, I think we have three mics. Book Davies is watching us. Marco Pol uh, Polo is watching. Tim Myers. Book, Book Davies says, good weather here, a bit of a warm before it cools off for good. Dale Beasley, howdy, uh, Richard Grace, Wade Prunty, David Ng, Dave Ng, um, Tyler Bowman, 
Hey, Tyler, how can you be in chat and live at the same time? Multitasking. I guess I'm doing it too. Eduardo Simone is watching. Um, um, Brett Blake. Uh, I mentioned Norm Hughes, of course. Um, Chuck Starr, Shailendra Sharma. Who else? Lots of comments from the same guys. Ollie Crabtree is watching. How you doing? Um, who else? Ollie says, I'm not staying for long because I have, I have school in the morning and it's quite late here. Okay. Glad you're watching it for a little bit. Let's see. Hermandez87 is watching. Uh, they want to know who the person's name, friend of Paul. I gave it to them. Uh, of course, it's Deep T Gautam. And um, Deep T will be on we, the first hour of the show. We have, uh, we have David Levy and David Eicher. Um, uh, Deep T will be on and then uh, also um, Libby and the Stars. So she'll be in that first hour. <clears throat> um, of course, Gary Palmer, which we already mentioned watching Wolfgang's watching a German guy has made an app that you can sh uh, says you can share the cam in the smartphone also doing flats bias and darks well Wolfgang you'll have to tell us what the app is uh, Dale Beasley's watching um, who else I think I've named everybody if I didn't name you uh, welcome anyways. Ken Noble's watching. Tim Myers is watching. We're glad to have you here. So <laughs> thanks for watching. So up next here, we've got uh, Tyler Bowman. And Tyler's been really busy um, getting his uh, new rig going. So why don't you show it to us, Tyler? Okay, I'm going to have to mute this screen and go to my phone. So I don't have the portability okay. like Scott does. No. there and share screen oh, hold on hold on uh where i'm gonna remove to... that again so you are screen broadcast come on share here we go mm. you are sharing screen i think hang on That's bear with me <clears throat> i don't know how to do it on the iphone this is very confusing This. Hang on, let me just do it this way. Yeah, do it Bring that on. way. There you go. go. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Oh. All so right. you got For the grand tour here. So the CWO twenty six hundred. Okay. Sitting on top of a FCD one hundred one twenty seven. I have my little mini Nook, which is a uh, Intel processor. The Pegasus Power Box with a ZWO 118 guide camera with a 120 or a guide scope, and then I have a 120 mm -hmm. on the guide camera with, of course, the Laws Mandy G11. Okay. Does that guide scope have like a helical focus on it, or it does have a helical focuser on it right does there? It it's already been preset and everything. Yeah. That looks like it locks. Okay. It does lock. Mm -hmm. So on the other side, you're going to don't mind the nasty mess. It's nice. Nice. All right. You got of course, PMC the PMC-8. There's and... my electrical outlet for the house. So you're I just like going to run it off of AC, I guess. Yeah, right? straight AC. It's the mm -hmm. only way to do it. Mm -hmm. I like that uh, dovetail plate that you got there. <laughs> that laws, uh, which one? The top the one, one with here? The, holes, the one with the holes in it. Oh, uh, Laws Mandy D plate. Yeah, that's a yeah. Nice. I got them for both. And Alex helped me three three D print the holder for the computer. Okay, huh. nice. That way I can put stuff in the back. So it was kind of a mix between Scott's and mine. So I'm gonna mute this when I come back. There we go. Look at Tyler. So, he's, 
these uh there's that i'll leave that one Perfect. so that's basically it hopefully i can image but i got to do some tests on customers equipment tonight so hopefully i can get that out on wednesday i don't care about the election so i'll image tuesday too <laughs> and get that done <laughs> I got work to do. I don't have time to listen to who wins. Yeah, mess with all that, right? No, I don't mess with it. That's right. So I got work to do. You pay me to work, not to listen. People did like your your setup there. You're saying oh, you good. got a badass rig, Tyler. Can yeah. I say badass on? You just did twice. Twice. Okay. Sorry, guys. Yeah. I think, Anyways, <laughs> I think you can say other semi bad words too, like. It's your show. You do what you oh, want. Let's not list all the bad words. We can say it on live streaming okay so it's just it's like having ha saying something half-assed that's a half-assed you know way of doing things jerry's, jerry's favorite word jerry's favorite uh, word uh -huh. as far jerry as god scott, scott's a lot worse than i am believe it oh i believe it i hear him when the door shut i, I, I hear words I, I hear very... words coming out like whew. i don't say bad words often sure oh yeah i guess if i dropped a sledgehammer on my foot i might but all right and on that note mm -hmm. <laughs> on that note we're going to move over to jerry so jerry has been working on new firmware so what what's the update i've been working on firmware changes that some of them have been we've been talking about for a while how best to do it um some of the things to streamline some of the operations that you use right now for configuration manager uh we're going to add some features that allow you to do not have to use configuration manager to do these changes and the, one of the, the primary one is the switch between wi-fi and serial all right that's always kind of a pain although it's not too it's a lot better than what it used to be when I first released the, when we first released the PMC-8, you had to go into a terminal program and issue a command. And then we went to the, then Chris uh, Moses developed the uh, configuration manager program that we use today to do the switch. But that requires a computer to be connected. And if you use Explore Stars and you're out in the field, um, and you left your PMC-8 connected through serial and you're out in the field and you're trying to connect your PMC, your explore stars tablet and you say dag nabbit <laughs> i left it in serial mode <laughs> you know what do you do you don't have a computer with you really so what we're doing is we're creating a uh, we put a new function in the uh, firmware that uses the right now it's called the wi-fi channel changing device or the dongle which i called it a dongle right now that just switches uh the wi-fi channel but there's a way to to use it now when we get the firmware updated mm -hmm. to switch between serial and wi-fi also so depending on how you use the the channel changing device it will either change the channel or it will um switch between serial and wi-fi and the way that's going to work uh, is that if you boot it up with the dongle installed, it will switch between Wi-Fi and serial. It'll toggle it. If you boot it up and uh, and it's running, and then you put the uh, Wi-Fi channel changing device in, then it will switch the channel. The other feature that we've added is um, when it boots up, it'll give you some more flashing light, the green flashing light that comes on for the process light. Mm -hmm. When it boots up, it will tell you what mode it's in. It will tell you whether it's in serial or in Wi-Fi mode by flashing once for serial and twice for Wi-Fi. So, so it'll, those kind of little features that we're adding to make it easier for people to see what it's doing and to give us more information when it boots up. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Good. There's a couple. There's other things that we're doing uh, that deal with uh, storing things in memory in the permanent uh, uh, EEPROM memory for configuration settings and things like that. We're just cleaning up some stuff there uh, that'll help us in the future. But that 
that's really the major change is the one I just described that we're going to be releasing. There's some, oh, the other thing that's going to be useful is I'm, I'm improving the uh, motor current, the way it's used in the, in the, uh, to extend the battery life. Oh, good. A little longer. So right now the battery, the current values are set to a fixed value basically to give you the best performance while slewing and tracking but it's a little bit high for tracking. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna lower the current for tracking. Uh, it's not as high as it needs to be while it's slewing. It'll, it'll boost it up for slewing, which means it'll be a lot more robust. It'll handle a lot more imbalance. And then when it's tracking, it will not use as much energy. So it gets the best of both worlds. And then overall, you'll, you'll, your battery will last longer. Right, that's great. So. Well, I mean, it already has manages battery yeah. life pretty good. So yeah, it's pretty low right now, but it, we can we can get it better. So so when we started working on the PMC eight um, at the very beginning, uh, one of the things that we we wanted to know is how long it would run off the smallest battery, and and for a while Jerry was uh, uh, working with a nine volt transistor battery. Yeah, I had yeah I had it powered <laughs> up with a nine volt battery. How long were you able to get it to run when you when you first started using using it with a nine volt? Um, that was really with an early prototype. That was when we were trying yeah. to make a small board with the Exos two. Actually, the first thing around, right. and then uh, I don't I don't know if I ever really drained a battery fully. I think I got it. I ran it for an hour or two. I think at least off a nine volt battery. That's pretty mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Yeah, I'm running. I, I have this marine or this lithium iron uh, uh, 12 volt deep cycle battery running my system. So I think it'll run it all month. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. We're actually testing it right now, and uh, uh, Alex made like this little uh, electronics box on there that shows the power draw and how many volts are coming through and everything. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I can monitor it because I. Yeah, unlike Tyler, I, I you know I don't trust AC power, okay, and uh, so I'd like to have more of a you know kind of off grid type of options. So one of the getting... things we're, I'm Go sorry, ahead. one Go of the ahead. things we're doing with the firmware also is making it so that we put limits on the maximum current or the maximum setting. Okay. But we'll allow users to probably configure their motor current, get it down lower, lower if they want to lower it even further. If it performs like they want, you know, if it still performs well, we, I don't know that we're going to test it down to a low, low value, but people will be able to configure it to very low current values and to extend their batteries a really long time. And yeah. if it performs, then it'll be fine. Well, if they're not doing a lot of slewing, you know, and just doing so for example, 600 right now for the 600 milliamps is set for tracking. Yeah, and that's probably a lot more than what it needs, because basically the torque when the slower the motor goes, the higher the torque output from the motor. So when you're tracking, it's a very slow output uh, in terms of uh, the rotation rate. So that means it's a maximum, basically maximum current. Uh, is at the bottom maximum torque, I should say, is at the at the bottom end. So you could you could probably lower it from right now. Like I said, we got it set to 600. You could maybe go to 400 milliamps or 300 milliamps, and ha and twice, and that would extend your battery by almost two times. Right. Uh, compared to what we have today, when you're just if you're just tracking for hours on end. Mm-hmm. Really cool. Really cool. Well, um, Richard Gray says that dew heaters are his biggest draw, but I'm surrounded by water. You know, mm -hmm. Arkansas, we're also surrounded by water. We have water, water everywhere. You know, it's crazy. Um, it's just, uh, you know, it's a, it's a state that has very dark skies, but not very transparent skies most of the time. So... But uh, I think this week, I think that we're going to have a good week um, going all the way through. And uh, I'm thinking about um, pulling, the, pulling the, the 102 scope that I have out and um, uh, firing it up for the uh, Global Star Party on Wednesday. So, you know, I'm, I'm excited about doing that. 
Um, and I don't know. I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm looking forward to this week because we have two global star parties. We have not only on Wednesday but Saturday morning. I'm gonna have to rip myself out of bed. I guess at about three thirty in the morning or something, because at six a.m. we have uh, we'll be live with the Asian edition, the first Asian edition of the Global Star Party. So and that's co-hosted with Christopher Go and. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, we have uh, 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 astronomers and astrophotographers through like Singapore, Thailand, um, uh, you know, of course, the Philippines and, and other countries within, uh, within Asia. And we might have some uh, people joining in from the States. In fact, I know uh, uh, Daniel Barth, who's uh, the STEM um, professor of, of uh, STEM and outreach for University of Arkansas, is going to be joining us, so uh, we'll have at least one uh, uh, one USA guy uh, aside from myself. So <laughs> Eduardo says, "Who are you kidding? You're still up, Scott. <laughs> That's the secret. You just don't go to sleep. <laughs> you just don't go to sleep." So anyhow, um, I think that's all I have to share today. Um, uh, let's see. I don't know if we. Let me see if we have any questions. Don't see any questions here. I was going to ask Heath, did, were you on? Did you run a program when I showed my lunar images, the full disk, uh, the full frame images of the moon from the astro camera instead of using a long focal length? Did I, I show don't think you so. That? No, let I don't me, think I was. Let me show you that real quick again. I'm going to. Sure. I'm going to. Let me. Uh, let me find it. Go ahead. Um, Michael Whitaker has a question for you. He says, um, after imaging, when I preview my light frames, I have noticed about 10 frames out of 100 have elongated stars in them. Is that down to tracking? Is that down to the tracking? Is he auto-guiding? I don't know. Michael, are you auto-guiding? Let's see. Daniel Sanchez says, hello, Heath. Um, Puerto Rico is raining a lot, not a lot to view these days. That's too bad. Hello, Daniel. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, you can see that Heath, right? Yeah. All right, so the this should be similar to the resolution that you had, maybe a little better. Uh, you were on the 102, but my pixel scale was probably a little different than yours. Yeah, I'm gonna assume so. You had, you had, um, did you have a focal uh, extender on your telescope with it? The 102, is that uh, what you were using? Yeah, no, I just had the 102. No focal extender. That's 714. This is 851. And, but you're, um, maybe it should be similar to this. So this crater here, I'm just going to talk about this real quick because this is where they discovered the water at, on Clavius. This is crater Clavius. That's where they discovered the water or NASA announced that they discovered water in that, in that uh, crater. <clears throat> so this was this was a, a video, an AVI video that I stacked with auto stacker and then used uh, um, Registax to do the wavelet filtering. So you get an idea of which you should be able to get with that scope, I think. Yeah, I, was, I used Registax to clean it up quite a bit. Yeah. Well, once once you get a good moon, you can see the Terminator. You'll be able to see all these details in these craters. You know, the shadows really bring out the detail. 
But this image, you can see craters down to around oh, around three, three, around five miles or so, three to five miles is what you can detect craters here. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you. Keith. Yes, pretty share awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Very cool. Okay. All right. I think uh, I think there was one more question. Um, if I'm imaging with a with a three nanometer uh, sodium two and a three nanometer oxygen three and a five nanometer HA, should I still avoid imaging while the moon is pretty full? Question mark. What do you think, Jerry? Uh, that's such a narrow band. Um, yeah. And, I'd try and, it anyways. I would I would try I would just go ahead and try it. Now if you if the moon's within twenty degrees or so or thirty degrees, then it does get tough because you get a lot of stray light coming into the side of your telescope. It depends on how good your telescope is in baffling is what it comes down to. Um, you can very much image that in that narrow band any kind of object. In fact, that's what uh, um What's what's the fellow's name? I can't remember. Scott um, that does the narrowband imaging in the middle of Detroit. What's that? Who's that that images in the middle of Detroit that we've had him on? Oh, Chuck Ayub. Chuck Ayub, yeah. Chuck Ayub measured. You know, the sky is bright as heck in Detroit. So anything, if you got fairly good skies, even though you got the moon out, you should be able to image. Um image it fine. So Stefan is saying that he sent an image or a message to me on Facebook. I'm trying to figure out which Facebook page he has done that with. <clears throat> we will check. We get messages from everywhere. <laughs> But Stefan, if you want to send me a message directly, just send it to my email address. Here it is. So I see that uh, Ben's got a question about where do I place the Barlow lens between the can and the can. So the Barlow is, if you use it visually, you would place the eyepiece right under the Barlow. And the same thing with a camera. You just place the camera right under the Barlow and then you focus. Now you may have a hard time reaching focus depending on how much focus travel you have. Um, Barlow's also change their magnification. Tele extenders don't, uh, if you position the camera, you know, depending on how far from the, from the main optic in the Barlow, the eyepiece or the camera is, it'll change the magnification, uh, where a tele extender will not. Right. That's true. That's true. All right. Stefan, I'm looking for your uh, message, but, uh, um, and that's not a dumb question, Ben. Uh, you know, a lot of people ask that question. The best thing to do is to try it though. When you put it in one position versus another versus something else, so. That's overall in this in this hobby. That's the best best advice is to just try it. If you have a question about something, even if you've something. got all the calculations done, you know you still need to try it to see if it's reality or not. So, right? Eduardo wants to know: Can you use a tele extender and a Barlow? Uh, I don't recommend it. <laughs> It's just you like probably, you probably could. I mean, too many connections. Bloody, and... Yeah, you can. You may not reach focus though. That's the problem. Yeah. Right. All right, guys. All right. Anything else to share, Jerry? Heath? I'm good. Yeah, all good. Uh, huh? All good. All right, guys. Well, thanks for watching, you guys. Uh, we will see you tomorrow. Uh, with Kent Martz uh, for the First Light uh, Chronicles and um, and then back on Wednesday for the 100th show, okay? And we did promise that we would have a, a special 100, uh, 
100th uh, door prize for that. So uh, we'll let Jerry figure out what the question's going to be and and we'll go from there. So oh, I get to come up with a question again. Yeah, good. Yeah, you got to do another question. You haven't done it in a long time. So, mm -hmm. right? No. Right. That's great. Everybody, thanks for watching today. Um, and we will see you soon.